Do 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 do. Start off like this. Do 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 do. Happy Halloween! Happy Halloween to you! Do 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 well, I'm back, okay? So let me put my little Darth Vader back there. Well, happy Halloween, everybody. We're back. We're ready to go. Okay, so it's been a couple of months since I've been here. So uh, looking forward to get back into this and uh, make sure uh, we touch on the things that we've been uh, doing throughout the time here. And, uh, you know, in honor of Halloween... Uh, I figure, you know what, let's do a little dress up. <laughs> Why not? So, uh, this is actually, uh, the CEO of Pixelage. So this is Mr. Uh, Jaime Lobel. So this is going to be now Sir Jaime, because he's a knight, obviously. So we're dressing him up for Halloween. That's what we're doing here for the stream today. So, uh, I want to walk through, um, because I'm using multiple features here, actually to make this happen. And I really want to go through the process of kind of where my head is when I'm doing something like this is something as simple as this, right? Pierre, you like that, huh? Sir Jaime. So <laughs> I want to go through the various ways that I'm, I always like to describe ZBrush kind of as like a cake sometimes. And you're using one feature with another feature and you're layering things and you can get to a very cool result quite fast uh, by working with this. So I want to start really quickly of how I even made these little pieces. Um, and you notice as we go on here, we're going to talk about, I want to talk about how I'm using uh, array mesh here. I'm using nano mesh here. So I want to cover that. I'm using surface noise. These pieces are made by the topology brush. This is scan data of Jaime. So I'm combining a lot of different features. This is, I used, a, I made a brush to make these, right? So there's a lot of different ways for me to go about this. So I wanna kinda show you guys, and then this, I wanna show you guys how I made these. Um, I actually used a ray mesh to make these. So I wanna show the various ways that I did this, okay? So I want to start with just the simple stuff first and how I even made these pieces here and how I got to this point, all right? So this is going to be our goal. Hey, you know, let's maybe put a little, we always have a little, we always want to have little Sir Jaime looking down upon us. Let's, for just for, just because it's Halloween, let's have some fun here. Yes, there, there always will be a Jaime looking at us in the top corner, all right? So, uh... This is all I did, is I started with something that ships with ZBrush. So in the light box in our tool here, we've got our models here. I just use this one right here, this Nick Zuccarello model, right? So I'm like, all right, why create a base mesh human? I've already got it, right? So, and I was planning to bring the scan data of Jaime just because I wanted to have fun with it today and say, uh, we're deck, you know, it's Halloween. Let's, uh, let's give him a costume, okay? So... In my subtool list, okay, you're going to see all the subtools I'm using here, all right? And this is the one I actually started with right here. It's really, now it's really scary to look at it this way. So I'm going to turn off all the subtools but this one, okay? So again, to do that, all you guys got to do is hold the shift key, click on the little eye, hold the shift key, click on the eye, and it turns off all your subtools. Nothing, nothing wow factoring yet, right? Okay, so... This is just his mesh, and I've divided it up, okay? And then I've deleted the subdivision levels. So you guys can see that. I've just divided it up and then deleted the subdivision levels. Nothing crazy, all right? We're going to throw on symmetry, and then this is all I do. Now, for me, uh, a lot of, as a kid, I did a lot of drawing and things like that. So any way that I can 
put drawing kind of feel back into my sculpting workflow, I actually dig and I like it. All right, so for me, I wanted to figure out a little bit of where I wanted to go with this, okay? So I wanted to just start masking out and thinking, mm, what do I want this shoulder pad in essence? Or we're doing a night, right? So what is this gonna look like? So I'm just quickly masking out. This is more of just a visual. I actually don't need to fill it in, but it's my, I think my OCD that has to have this, this needs to be 100% masked. It really doesn't need to be. All I'm worrying about is this portion out here, right? So this allowed me to start figuring out I want the design to come down here because I'm gonna put those little circular discs, right? So putting a little bit of that in there, okay? And then I can remove portions, right? Because I'm just using masking. So it's just a, a very quick way for me to figure stuff out, okay? And then I can move around and go, do I like this? You know, I wanted more of it at the back to kind of come through and protect his scapula, right? So I wanted to have a little piece of that because I knew I was going to make another big armor piece around his neck and come down the back. So I wanted to figure out how big do I really want this portion to be that's going to be on his back. So it's a really quick way, in essence, I'm almost working in a drawing 3D idea where I'm looking through and going, all right, I kind of like that. Right now, of course, I can also make a new poly group, right? So I can make a new poly group in here, and we can even do things with panel looping that can have some fun here. Okay, so I don't really need that. Okay, all I really want to do for this particular workflow is just look at the mask. And now, what all I did is switch to my handy dandy topology brush. Okay, so all I'm going to do now is, in essence, draw trace. This is why I'm just using the masking. I'm just, it's more of a visual thing for me to say, I want a line here, perfect. And then looking at the back, and then of course I'm working symmetrically, I want a line here, right? And then now I want to start coming through the top, right? So what some things about this brush, as I'm drawing through here, right, I can continue my stroke now. So you see when it goes from a red to blue or an aqua, that aqua color means that, hey, I can continue expanding upon this curve. Okay, so I'm going to say I want to expand upon that curve and then just make it longer. And now because they're connecting there, you get a green circle. So things to help you with this brush. So you can see as I move closer and closer, that's when it becomes alive for me to, in essence, play expanding along the curve. So something that you guys might want to know about is right here in the stroke palette. Okay, you see this curve snap distance. And mind you, this goes for anything with the curve applied. So even those insert mesh brushes that you're using, okay, you're gonna, these same things I'm talking about right now are gonna apply to this, okay? Uh, yes, I'm gonna show you actually, it's a good question an option to edit the points of the topology brush. You can't edit them. So all you can do is delete it. There's no, once it's drawn out, it's there. You can't move the points anywhere. We don't, we don't allow that at this point, right? So, but your points in essence, these yellow, black, yellow, black is determined by your draw size. So when it's the red draw size, that's what's determining how many of those yellow, black, yellow, black, which in essence, those are vertex points being drawn out. Okay, so back to this, this curve stepping here. So if I put this up, let's just put it up to 50. So you can see I won't need to get as close and then there you go, now it's alive, right? So you can see I switched off when there's a red line there. That means it's snapping already to the line and allowing me to draw out, okay? So this by default, we made it kind of low because there's gonna be times where I wanna start drawing, right? And I might want to actually, you know, uh, do more with the curve as I'm drawing. So this is kind of, I want this kind of flat. So I'm actually going to put a line here. I'm doing these lines on purpose because I want to create a vertex point right there. That's my goal. So now I can just draw and trace this. Boom, there I go. All right. And then now I want to draw here and then just trace this line. 
Okay, so I've got all these excess lines sticking out, so I can clean them just like that. So, just like that. <laughs> what did I just do there? All right, so holding the Alt key, click and dragging anywhere on the mesh that's not over the lines, that deletes all the excess lines that are sitting there. Okay, just fun-filled fact for you. All right, for those that maybe didn't know. Okay, and then of course, deleting just one point at a time or one line here, hold the Alt key and draw over top of it and then it deletes it, right? So instead of me sitting here going to everyone, I'm just doing a quick clean, okay? The other thing that you guys are able to do with these curves, even though we don't allow you to edit the points, okay? There is things though you can improve the curve quality, right? So you can see right in here, my hand probably moved a little bit, all right? In the stroke palette, besides having this slider, in the curve functions, there's actually a smooth button with another slider. Okay, so if I hit this smooth, it'll look like not much is happening. Let's open this up, okay? And then so you can see the shortcut, okay, that is six. So he says smooth curves and has the number six. That means by default, this shortcut is number six, right? So if I hit the six key, you can see the curve actually moves. So all of them are moving. So that's doing is smoothing it out more. What, what I really like about that is, before we continue on with this, thinking about this brush, if I start, I'm gonna take symmetry off for now. If I start doing something, something like this, and then something like that, and see I've kind of not matched them up a little bit, I can hit the six key and see it makes them nice and clean now. So that's really the real big benefit of having that smoothing. And again, I've made it really strong by opening this little dot. So this little dot here, you see it throughout ZBrush. We're doing that on purpose. That means that there's two, in essence, types of algorithms to this smoothness. So a closed dot, okay, means try to keep the form, okay, as much as you can. An open dot is just smooth that thing out, smooth it out, right? And don't worry about the form. I'm going to take a little swig of water right here while I read a question. All right, just just taking a out of my swell ZBrush bottle. All right, okay, very good. Okay, so this becomes pretty important for you guys because again, this what I'm talking about is not just for the topology brush. It's gonna work the same with the Z Remesher guides. Any brush that has a curve in it, so all these brushes that start with curve, right? Any insert mesh brushes that have a curve to it. All these features I'm telling you, they all work together, right? And these are Z, the Z Modeler brush as well. I mean, sorry, not Z Modeler, Z, mesh, Z Remesher guides. It's all gonna do the same thing. What's up, guy? Just say hello to the people out there. Jose, how are you? Okay, so getting back to this, right? So as for those that have joined me, I like to be Captain Tangent sometimes. So I've gotten these points drawn out. Now all I need to do is add some topology. And you can see the minute I start crossing over, okay, I get things. So you can see what's happening here. Do you see the point is not actually, they're not touching. Because you see the curve? because I smoothed it so much, it actually got pulled off the surface, right? So it's, by default, when you draw this, we're snapping this to the surface, right? But because I started going crazy with the smoothing, here, I'll get an angle that's just right. Yeah, right, just right there, there. So you can see there's a gap. So what's happening is this curve, right, is snapping to the surface, but because this point is no longer attached to the surface, it's not creating that green circle vertex, right? So this goes back again, so let's undo that, to this first slider I showed you. If I did run into this issue, all I have to do is turn up this curve snapping. Let's put it at 50, okay? And then now you can see that line, and now I can draw, and then there you go. So even though I pulled it off by smoothing it so much, okay, I can still remedy that. And that's how I remedied that, right? So again, I've got a pulled off and I'm just saying, all right, well, let me just draw from here and come across, 
and then there you go. And then now I can continue this process, right? So again, I'm in the stroke palette, and then I'm gonna put this back down the 10, and then I say, I definitely wanna draw through there, right? I definitely wanna draw through that point, right? And you can see we start to create the geometry that I want for this particular shoulder piece. And then there we go, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, I've got this. Now, you're gonna notice when I look at this view, you can see those orange faces, those are your polygons being created, okay? So I can see that there's a curve in the shoulder, but my polygon's going straight across. This is also where the smoothing comes into play as well. So if you keep smoothing this, these curves that are actually rounded to the surface would actually lay flat exactly where that edge is, which becomes important if you're trying to keep very nice clean edges, okay? That's what you would want to do. So what I mean, what I mean by that, let's here, let's grab something else. Uh, let's grab a cube really quick because I don't want to keep messing up my guy, all right? I love that there's always a Sir Jaime in the top here watching us. I love it, I love it. Uh, I'm just reading Doug's question. So it would be best to not smooth the curves until after all the lines have been laid down on the surface so they all connect. No, not necessarily, but it depends, Doug, you know, uh, for what I'm about to show, right? Maybe that'll also help answer some of that question for you. The vote's not over, by the way, Gary. The I just, because it was Halloween and uh, I haven't been on here for months, I'm like, you know, we're going to make a Halloween costume for Jaime. And that's just what we're going to do. So we're continuing the vote from the previous um, vote. So you're the first time joining me here for the Did You Know That? We like to put a vote. So in that bottom that bottom corner, so screen bottom left for you, we have voting going on through there. So you guys can cast your votes. So Kingsley and uh, the boys will share the stream poll. Kai already did put it in the chat. All right, so back to this. Man, I am going tangentville today. So... <clears throat> When I'm drawing something, let's say I want to do this, I want to draw this, right, and draw this, and then draw that, right? You can see I'm making kind of just trying to make a square. But if you look, right, this line is not quite lining up with the edge. So what's going to happen if I do this, I'm now creating that arc actually in the surface. And do I want that? Let's, let's actually go a little more extreme with this. Let's delete this. Let's delete these and let's go a little more extreme. Let's do something like that, right? So uh, do I want that arc or not? In the case that I'm working on with my knight, I do want these arcs. But in this case, no, I want to kind of stay very box and very squared, right? So this arc is not going to work for me because if I want to draw across and get more polygons in these faces, I'm now giving that arc into the geometry itself, okay? So... What I'm going to do instead is hit that six key. So let's make this really strong. All right, let's make it 100% strong and hit that six key. And you can see that curve is now going to, the more and every time I click it, it just keeps moving it and moving it and moving it and moving it. And as long as I keep clicking and clicking and clicking, that's eventually going to line up exactly where the edge is which becomes important to me because do I want that roundness or not? And then now when I draw out, right? I know I'm getting straight polygons, right? And you can see this isn't lining up. So I hit that six key, boom, they line up. So not only using the six key to kind of help the smoothness that you want, but using it maybe, I don't want any smoothness. I want to make sure everything stays wherever that line's drawing, that edge that I just added. I want that trans, I want the <clears throat> topology brush to actually sit right there. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Just making sure, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to adjust this a little bit. It's falling on me. There we go. My, my camera's falling on me. Okay. So hopefully that makes you guys understand. So going about this then is my problem here is I just don't have enough geometry, right? Coming across here. So this is why I would probably do another edge here. Add probably another one down here because I want to make sure I'm making fairly good size polygons. I don't want to make something that's too large. So I'm adding two edge loops through here, right? And then coming across and then same thing here coming across, right? And all I'm doing to draw really quick is I'm looking to pay attention 
look up here, look up here, look up here. Right? I'm looking at, I don't know why I'm doing, okay? I'm looking at going from red to blue, and I'm seeing this blue, and then that tells me visually I know I'm going to be just adding to the curve. I'm not drawing a new curve. I'm adding to the curve, okay? So then I'm going to come across here, and then boom, I have the mesh. Um, bringing Dallas back, I mean, bringing the summit to Dallas. We used to do user group meetings, Peter. I know I did one in Dallas years ago. Possibly. Possibly. It's, you know, <clears throat> our UGMs that we used to travel around and do, you never know. You never know. I can't say definite 100% for sure. Okay, so all I'm doing now, okay, is I've got all my lines, and now I want to say, all right, give me the mesh, okay? And then I just tap on the surface, and then I get the mesh, right? And I'm looking at a smooth version of him right now. So I have dynamic on, so there's the mesh. So how thick do I want this to be? So I'm going to undo that, right? And then I'm going to go my brush size a little bit bigger, and then tap, and I'm going to say, that's thick enough for me. Okay, and you can see how this is not sitting right that's just because if i really if i want that to sit maybe a little bit better maybe i say you can see again it's not following the surface so maybe i just add another line through here and then now it's going to sit better right whoops i'm used to having an apple computer and then click right and then now you see you're going to get something a little bit closer to what i want right and again i'll look at it on smooth and then i say okay perfect that's what i'm looking for i'm going to go to my split and because right now it's part of the body i don't want it to be part of the body actually okay so what i want to do is split it so i could do split to parts split this and really i can click any four of these right here i don't want to click group split because that's going to take every single poly group and then make it its own sub tool right so I want to do either on, it doesn't matter really, any four of these at this point would work because right now the whole body is masked off and that new armor piece is not, okay? So what I want to do is just say split by unmasked points, it's done, there's my shoulder piece. And that's what I have. So what I did here is I want to use another option for us, okay, which is a ray mesh. I want to have that capability. So what I'm going to do is I drew on the opposite side. So this is something important. I want to mirror it over possibly to the other side, right? So see this little mirroring? I'm just flipping it to the side. So what I'm looking at is this red line. That's the positive side of X. And usually I do that because there are several features inside of ZBrush, right, that work with this capability, all right? So what I'm doing is... I want to start editing this and messing around with this. So I'm going to switch to my handy dandy gizmo. I'm going to hit this little, I like to call it a little map quest, old school little finder. I'm here. This is where I am. So in essence, that's what you're doing in the gizmo. Funny it is, it's the easiest way I can explain it. You're hitting that little thing and you're moving the gizmo to the home. That's where I want it to be. Okay? So <clears throat> what I want to do is maybe just really maybe adjust this a little bit more, maybe make it be right through there. And I'm gonna say, that's that's not bad. I don't mind it, maybe even adjust the size a little bit. Perfecto. I like it, looks good, okay? Now, we definitely have symmetry capability within ZBrush, right? I could just go to geometry here, go to modify topology and do mirror and weld. This is why I wanted it on the positive side of the world of X, okay? So this feature, only looks at the positive side of the world. So it's only looking at that red line side, right? Everything else on the opposite side, it's ignoring, okay? So I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but there are multiple ways to do this, okay? So also in your plugins, right? In Subtool Master, there's actually a mirror right here, right? And then this tells you, Hey, do you want it to be the same subtool? Do you want to be appended as a new subtool? And what axis? And then I hit OK, and there you go. So why do we have it in both locations? Well, because you know they were coded different times. But but what's nice about the one in the plugin is when I do this, I've added subdivision levels. Mirror and weld does not work with subdivision levels. 
but this plugin does work with subdivision levels. Boom! Now we've got a copy, and I'm not losing my subdivision levels. Pretty cool. So I know there's a lot of people that maybe aren't aware of that, but there you go. There you have it. All right? So I'm going to undo this because really what I want to do, okay, to this particular guy, let me undo back. There we go, to no subdivision levels. I want to, number one, just look at it dynamic. So instead of worrying about subdivision levels, right, I just want to look at this dynamic capability. And all I'm doing is telling ZBrush in the dynamic subdiv, how many subdivision levels do I want to preview? So I want to preview three, four, and then now I'm previewing four. Okay, for me, for this guy, I want to now to bring in array mesh, okay? And I wanted to tell ZBrush, take this array, okay, and then mirror it along the X, right? So all I'm doing is, in essence, flipping. I flipped it. I flipped you. I flipped you for it. I flipped you for it, right? And then I'm going to switch to transpose line, okay? And then I can do the transpose, and then I can move it around if I want to. And I've got a flipped version of it. So I can now look at the design as a whole, right, and see what I have, okay? So it gives me a capability to, you know, mirroring it across, and then I have multiple versions of it, and then I can look at the movements, the span, and see what do I want to play with within there, right? So this is what I was doing with all the pieces, okay? So the beauty of this now is, even though I'm not actually divided, even though I don't have any copies, right? I actually don't need to work in symmetry. So then I switched to something like Z Modeler. And then I said, you know what? I want a lip right here. So I'm gonna Q mesh by the poly loop. I'm gonna pull that out. I'm gonna tap the Alt key until I get a new poly group. I'm gonna say, yeah, right about there. And then let's make the lip come out like maybe that much. Right? So now if I hit the smooth, this is what I get. So am I looking for a very harsh look or I'm looking for a soft look? Right? So looking at the geometry here, right? That's creased and that's creased. So I'm over the edge. I'm going to switch to crease. I'm going to say edge loop complete. I'm now going to hold the alt key and I'm going to make that actually a rounded look there instead of a harsh look. Right? And I even have an extra edge loop right here. If I don't want it, I can go to insert and delete it. And see now that's crease because it crease moved up. I can even delete that edge loop if I want to throughout here, right? So <clears throat> I'm gonna say, let's look now with this uncreased. And then now this is what I get. So you see by deleting that edge loop, we got more of a even more softer look through here because there's not an extra edge loop there controlling the gap. So you see there was what we had that has the edge loop, this edge loop going through there, okay? And then this is what we have without the edge loop, right? So that edge loop does make a difference, right? So it's creating more of a, I wanna say a chamfer there for us. And then this is now how I made all the pieces. So going back and looking at him again, okay? This is how all these pieces were made. It was just that workflow. So if I start turning all these on, right? There's there's all the front pieces. That's the shoulder piece. That's the straps, right? I can start turning on all these pieces throughout here, and we can, we can't think of can't forget about Jaime. You know, gotta have gotta have that, right? So there you go. That's that's how I made the pieces. The reason why. I chose to do the topology brush is I know I wanted to down the pipeline. I wanted to use UVs and having low polygon is way better to handle UVs with. So instead of using Dynamesh and masking and using panel loops, I chose to use the topology brush so I can get clean geometry. I can make big changes and it's going to be easy for me to do the UV. Okay. Oh, so Peter, you're having a hard time wrapping yourself around QMesh? Let's let's solve that for Peter. Let's help Peter out with that. That's the point of this ZBrush Live, okay? 
let's let's get going on this all right let's make sure you guys understand because q mesh is very unique very powerful and you can do a lot with it and i love it okay all right so here we i had to take another drink <clears throat> Well, they see some Joseph Dress Backyard stuff happening. I like it. Okay, so the right way to use this, okay? So let's let's look at this, Peter. Let's help you out, okay? Because I'm sure everybody wants some information on this, okay? So I'm just grabbing a cube. Now, I'll be honest with you people, ladies and gentlemen. When I am working hard surface specifically, I almost, I'd say almost, maybe 67%, 60 to 70% of the time, I like to use just a cube. I don't like this cube because of the poles. Okay? So I like to use this initialized cube in here. So when you have a mesh, you're going to have the initialized state that has what resolution do I want? So I can say I want eight along, seven along the X and say cube, and then see I get a cube that has seven polygons by two by two. So you say seven by two by two. Okay? So I usually like to work with just actually one face like this, and all I have is a six-sided cube. And then I like to re-polygroup. Okay, so you guys can do it this way, or, or we can throw on our gizmo again and use that new feature that's in 4R8, click in the gear, and we can hit polycube. And that actually replaces the selected mesh right now. Because it's not masked out, okay, I can select them. And then I can just go here, and these little these little controllers are, in essence, controlling your spans. So whatever way you guys want to go about it, there you go. I can either create it through the actual gizmo, through your primitives, and then I say what my spans, okay? Or you can go through that initialized state. So I see uh, Chuckster. So you're asking why aren't primitives built like this already? Are you talking about that cube primitive? Is that what you're talking about? If is that you're talking about why this primitive here isn't already built like that? Um, well, there's a reason because I can turn this cube into other things, right? So in order to do that, I need to have this pole in the middle to pull from. So it's not just a cube, right? And then I can add divisions any way I want, and then adding a twist. So it's just just the way they work. Because these are these are really powerful, right? I can go to a triangle, but not even that. I can go to this cylinder, right? And I can say I got an inner radius automatically, right? Have the divisions, right? I can even take something like the sweep, which is pretty powerful, and go here to my profile and start adding dots and completely change the way this looks. So I'm giving rounded, and I can make it harsh, and now it's got a harsh point. And then I can add another point here and convert it. All I'm doing is moving it on and off. I'm not taking my pen off the Cintiq. I'm just moving back and forth, and that'll move it from a harsh. If I click on, click on, now it's more of a softer point, right? And then I have things I can add thickness to it, and then boom, I'm going to start adding some thickness to this. So if I open this up, you guys can see we're making vases all right woo it's a vase or a vase whatever part of the world you're from okay so these primitives are in essence a mathematical equation right that's allowing us to do things right and then of course you can grab this gear and you can have some real fun with this right you can start really manipulating this and adding different things to it right so like for a spring I just grab this and I literally go to the radius and I just get rid of that point. So to delete a point, you just click and drag off and then let go. So you don't come back on the graph. So going back and forth in the graph changes from a harsh to a round point and just clicking off and doing that. And there you go, I got a spring. I actually use this as well to do threading for like a screw. So I did that as well, okay? So you have this capability to do this, right? So back to this cube, I'm just using instead, what we've done now in the new versions, we've put some of those primitives right here 
and then you guys can edit the primitives on the fly right here and we got these cones and I can do something like this I can change the shape of this I don't want that I want to go back to this and then I can add all those spans. So in essence, what we did is we started ripping these primitives out of the tool palette and made them right here on the fly because people, this is gonna get really powerful. I can start doing things like this, right? I can rotate this, put this where I can go here. You know what? I want this to be a ring now. Boom, now it's a ring. And you see it's the same size as what the cube was. So what I'm doing is I'm using the gizmo to duplicate. Right, so all I'm doing is holding the control key and then you can click on any arrow. It doesn't matter what arrow you click on. And then now I can go here and say, ah, I want a cone instead. Boom, now I've got a cone. And I can go back to the gizmo and I'm gonna say, let's rotate this 90 degrees. There you go. There, I'm making art, modern art. Okay, so getting back to where we were going with this, which is the Z Modeler brush, okay, and understanding, okay, Q Mesh mode. All right, so think about it in this way. Instead of us highlighting all the faces and things that we want to move around, we want to be a little bit quicker about this, okay? So I have symmetry on. So when you're hovering over a face, right, you get this red line and this that and that orange. And as I'm rotating around, that orange line moves. That's very important, okay? Yeah, there would be modern art. For, the, for Joseph's Backyard, I like that. We should all do like something for Joseph's Backyard. It should be a challenge we just do. Let's make something for Joseph's Backyard. For those that don't know that joke, when we did the stream, okay, we just made a bunch of stuff for Joseph's Backyard. So yes, little little Nemo, yes, you can retopologize um, inside of ZBrush as well if you want to, of course. <clears throat> okay. If you want to duplicate the object without moving, no, you got to you got to have a move cuz that arrow key is the action telling ZBrush to also to do the duplicate itself. If you want to duplicate something, um Doug, you're better off just going here and just hitting duplicate, which you can see is control shift D. That's what I would do to duplicate. And that's going to create a new subtool. Okay? So, what we're doing with the QMesh is pulling this out. So, this is not an extrude. Okay, in no shape, way, or form is this an extrude. It's very different, okay? So as I'm pulling out the face, I'm getting, see, a new edge loop, in essence, new geometry. I'm also getting new polygrouping, which becomes very important. So as I start pulling this, I can tap the Alt key and give myself a new polygroup. Okay, so if I want to do something with the edge, I don't have to switch a mode. I just hover over the edge. And you see right now it says crease edge. Hold the space bar and said I actually want to insert and then now I can insert edge loops. So then I have the capability to Q mesh and I have the capability to edge loop and the vertex point, right? I can move. So if I go to a little bit bigger draw size, I can move the vertex point, right? So in essence, I have all three actions right here at my disposal without having to have to actually switch things because the most I use more often is insert an edge loop and I used Q mesh. Those are my two main features. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> what is important about the Q mesh to understand? When you start, if I switch to just so you have an understanding, if I switch to extrude, which I very rarely use, okay, that's just extruding this. So you see I'm getting an extrusion. But our problem here is you've got all these spans. So what you're creating inside there is non-manifolding faces. So that means this big, huge face on this one rectangle is sitting in the same space as these four. So you got faces sitting on top of each other. No bueno, not good, okay? So what we did is instead of extrusion, let's use Q mesh and we can click and then boom, we snap and then now we allow an angle of change as well. Right, so I can say if I can go all the way to 100, boom, and then I can go to the next one because maybe I only want to go this far and I want that angle to happen. Okay, so what's controlling that is these options down here. So many of these modes, so think about this top mode is what do I want done to the mesh? Okay, this section here, the target is what faces, edges, or points do I want moved? Because you notice now I have multiple different polygrouping here happening. Okay, 
This down here is saying that stepping that's happening, that's giving that angle, okay, how many steps do I want? So if when I click, I start dragging, I can go now 10 steps here. Boop, 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 boop. Right? So if I'm going to say, uh, I don't want 10 steps, I want quarter steps. So now I'm only going to go to a quarter, to a half, three quarters, and a full. So I, again, I can only go now a quarter, a half, three quarters, and then a full step. Okay? These, all that's all this is doing. Third step, full step. Now, you can even bring triangles. So I can say enable triangle. Right? So I, let's just click at the half step. So the first step's actually going to be a triangle. Then I'll go halfway and then a full step. Okay? So these are just options down here. Okay? So what's nice about this is I'm able to do things like this and put an angle on it. So what also becomes very prevalent is this polygrouping. Okay? This becomes important. So I've got a purple and a red and I got a green, right? What if I only want to move the purple faces, okay? So I hold the space bar, right? And I tell ZBrush, I want flat and polygrouping, okay? That means when I click on this, it only moves the purple faces because they're on the flat area. So if I do this, these, all these faces right here, are on the same plane island. So look at, that's how ZBrush is looking at it actually. It's seeing that those are on the same plane island and the next ones are on a completely different plane. So that's how ZBrush sees this. So what I'm telling ZBrush is flat and polygroup. If I just did flat island, it's gonna move all of them, see? And then I can change the polygrouping on the fly. Very handy. Now, which becomes also handy is, mm, I'm not liking this anymore. I'm gonna go back to single polygon and I can click and actually delete and we're gonna make sure we close things up, right? So this can come in extremely handy. Let's, as an example, let's say I do an inset and I wanna do an inset here, okay? And I wanna have that same inset here. I just tap and I get the same inset. So I have the same size inset on both sides, okay? And then now watch, I can switch to a Q mesh, single polygon, push through, and you can see I created a hole and we've closed off. So you can use Q mesh to delete polygons, you can use Q mesh to add angles, you can use Q mesh to delete out stuff. It becomes extremely powerful. Okay? So hopefully that helps. Does that help more with understanding, uh, Peter, or where we're going with Q mesh? Spigoli, Bueller, Andy Dufresne. I'm just going to wait a minute because obviously there's a delay. I don't know when you guys get what I'm talking about. So let me know if that helps. Okay, great. Fabulous. Let's move back to Sir Jaime. All right. Let's get back to Sir Jaime here. So I wanted to start adding a pattern to this, obviously, this middle piece right here. I wanted to add a pattern. So right now, I'm just looking at dynamic subdivs. So let's just look at just this piece and only this piece, okay? We have a surface noise being applied right now. So let me turn this off. And when I smooth this, I'm looking at the smoothing going, is this really what I want? I'm like, mm, no, I want this edge right here, these edge loop here to be creased. So I'm gonna crease it and then that's what I want. And then this is the beauty of dynamic subdiv. I can see the result without actually dividing in real time. I mean, so it's really big for me as a, someone that likes to design hard surfaces. I'm gonna say, that's what I want. I want it really harsh through there and I wanna see what that is. So all I'm doing is just going to that edge, right? Switching to crease and doing complete edge loop and then, right? And then there you have it. So that's what I'm looking for. And what I wanted to do is start having a pattern to this. Okay, so again, this is why I use the topology brush. I'm staying pretty low in geometry. It's not really dense, okay? And I wanna use UVing. So I just did this to my UVs. And there you have it, okay? And I made these UVs inside of ZBrush, actually. Okay, so all I did is use our plugin. All right, so here, let's do it together. Let's get on. We're going on a journey. You tell a wing. All right. So in the plugin, okay, there is a plugin called UV Master. 
Okay, raise your hand if you use that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm going to tell Zebras to do is work on clone. And what it's going to do is make a copy of this, right? And then all I'm going to tell ZBrush to do is, based upon this, okay, I want you to use the polygrouping to help me lay out the UVs, okay? So now I'm just going to say unwrap, and then it's done. There. And I'm going to say flatten, right? And then this is what I have. So the goal of this plugin is trying to use as much of the UV space as possible, right? So if I unflatten this, you guys can do this, right? We can go now here to this actual mesh and see I've got a, that's a little hidden secret we're going to show next and throw on a checkered. So I can see how equally distributed. It's a really nice layout actually. And just so you guys know, in the UVs here, you can tell it to repeat. So I can say repeat by four, repeat by four, and that way I can get smaller squares because I might need to go smaller just to really see the pattern that I'm getting here. Right, looks pretty good. Yep. Okay, so I know for me in this particular design, the only thing that's really important to me is that blue part. I want that blue part. Hey, Ashley. Ooh, Ashley's joining. All right, awesome, welcome. Okay, so I only want that blue port there, okay? And I want to do it. ZBrush does support UDIMs, but not live within the document. It supports it upon exporting and importing. It'll know what UDIMs are, and you can assign polygroups based upon the UDIMs. But you can't look at multiple UDIM textures all at once uh, with inside of ZBrush. Not yet. Okay, so the blue part's the only important part to me. So I'm going to flatten this again, and I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to switch to the gizmo. I'm going to hold the control key and tap, right? So that I want just, what I want is I want just this blue polygroup here, right? So I want to have this here, okay? So I want to kind of, well, what can I do to mask this out? So I can use multiple things for this. So... Let me switch to the actual correct transpose so we can have that happen, right? So again, I'm just holding control and then I'm tapping on the actual blue and it masks everything else off. So I'm going to inverse that. I'm going to center this and I'm going to say these aren't really that important to me. Let's put them off in the corner a little bit because I'm not really worried about that. Now I'm going to inverse this, okay? I'm going to center this. Okay, I'm going to reset the gizmo. So I'm just holding the Alt key to reset the gizmo. And let's size this up. Right? This is what's really important to me. Okay, I want my UV space, okay, to be using most of the blue portion. That's the important part to me. So I unflatten this, right? And we turn this texture back on. You can see I'm using now more of that UV space. That's important because I'm going to take this out of ZBrush possibly sometime and maybe go into Photoshop, and that's exactly what I did with the first example that I want to show you guys. Okay, so I was trying to figure out what design do I really want to put on this. I'm like, hey, you know, let's make a little fun with this. Let's have them have a ZBrush logo chess piece, right? So I'm like, you know what? Because I have UVs, let's use the UVs. So I'm going to I send it to Photoshop. And I use Photoshop with GoZ Photoshop to figure out my UV space, right? Because I can send it to Photoshop and give them the 3D mesh. So all I did is come here, click on this little R, right? Which it's not installed. Let's see, not installed, not installed. There's Photoshop, okay? Right, and then fault, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna skip sculpture. So right here now, I can click Photoshop. And now if I hit this GoZ button, it's gonna launch Photoshop and it's gonna send it over to Photoshop for me. And it's gonna send the 3D mesh over for me is what it's going to send, okay? So with that idea, I went over there and I played with the actual flat version of the model instead of the 3D version, and I created this texture that you see here, right? So right now I'm telling the UVs to repeat. So obviously I don't want that anymore. So I'm gonna say one by one. And then there, 
right? You start having this. So this is obviously matching up to a different UV layout that I had. So that's what's matching up in here, right? This guy, see? And then I have this, right? So I'm just go Zing this over, right? And don't show it again. And then it's ZBrush is going to go through all the subtools. And because I hit go Z, it's only going to send the selected subtool. Okay? It's not gonna it's not gonna set send anything else. Right? So then this is bringing over an actual 3D mesh, number one, because now Photoshop since CS3 can handle a 3D mesh. There you go. But what I like to do is this right here, this little texture, I double click that so I can work on that. And so what I did is just lay out the image the way I want. And you can even see our UV layout. So I just lay things where I want them. I can use, you know, different graphics that I want and laying it based upon the UVs, right? And whatever I do in this UV layout here, it's going to update, right, inside of ZBrush for me. Okay, so all I have to do is go here now to send it back to ZBrush. I'm going to go back to the 3D model version, okay? And you can rotate it and look at it here, right? And I'm just going to go to File, Automate, and I'm going to say Go Z Plugin. And so whatever I do in Photoshop now, when it goes back to ZBrush, it's going to get updated. So even if I want to use the Photoshop painting brushes, right? So if I go to a brush and start painting stuff. Hi. Right? And then if I now say, let's send that back, I don't know why we'd want it, but let's go ahead and let's send it back, right? And now it's going through and then boom, it's updated. And this is being applied to a texture, right? So I'm not divided yet. I'm not marrying myself to subdivision levels, okay? And now this is just a texture that I'm using. Okay, so everyone follow me right now? So what's gonna happen is, I'm going to decide here. Let's let's load a, the original. Okay, I want to now start dividing up. So here's an important thing to understand what I'm about to show you. Okay, so this is especially for you production people in there right now. Okay, so you guys can understand this um, because I often have to answer questions about this when I go in and out of studios. When I'm going to divide up, right? What's happening to the UV space when I'm dividing? Well, number one, we're dividing that UV space, but then do those UVs have smoothing to them or not smoothing to them? Okay, so let's try it. So if I start dividing now, see what happens to, just look at the shield. See how distorted that got? They got really distorted. It's because right now when I'm dividing up, I'm telling ZBrush just keep the UVs harsh, right? but then the mesh is being smooth, okay? So what I'm gonna tell ZBrush to do, and this would be the only time maybe I would do something like this, I'm gonna turn on this little SUV next to the divide. That yes, SUV means smooth UVs physically to the mesh. So everyone, please understand this. When you do this, you're physically smoothing the UVs to the mesh, right? So if you're a person that's in this right now, that's exporting stuff, going to another renderer, whether it be V-Ray, RenderMan, Arnold, whatever it might be, okay? If you also then start making maps out of ZBrush and you also have this smooth UV on in the maps, for example, normal mapping, or the same thing with displacement map, right? You're almost doing a double smooth now because then you're doing a smooth on the mesh, right? So what I can do is I don't actually need to apply the smooth UVs as I'm dividing up, right? So I can tell ZBrush, let's just divide, 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 and keep going, right? I can tell it to turn on smooth UVs and do a re-UV, and then boom, right? So now I have just have those smooth UVs. So the only time I use this SUV is the very last point. Specifically, if I'm in a production where I'm trying to get the texture maps out and I know in the render I'm gonna smooth the UVs, this is the only time then I would turn it on, like I'm done with the model and I need to make the texture map. Other than that, I don't ever touch this button, okay? Because then you're smoothing the UVs and every time you walk up and down, because that button's on, we're gonna smooth the UVs. So if I turn this off and walk up and down, see, I'm good to go, right? See, it's gonna keep smoothing 
right? I don't want to have any of this happening. Okay, so for the sake of what I'm trying to show here is I know this particular texture that I've made based upon the UVs, I want it to have smoothing UVs on because I want this texture to be applied. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it on. Let's divide up a bunch, okay? So I can keep the texture looking the same. Let's let's go around 2.2. This is good enough for what we're doing. And the reason why I have a black and white, okay, is I want to use masking now, okay? So what I'm going to do, which many of you may have already been able to do this, is I'm going to go to masking, I'm going to go by color and mask by intensity. So what that does is it looks at the pure black and creates a mask. So here if we turn the texture off, okay, there's the mask. And then I can inverse it and now I have unmasked. So everything else is masked but this, right? And then now I can say let's go to something as simple as deformation. Let's do an inflate of one. And then there you go. And here I'll, I'll hide my mask. And now I have that design popping in the actual character, right? So I didn't like where I was going with this. I wasn't a fan of it, right? So going back to where we were, right? Let's, let's actually reload the tool. I'm going to reload Sir Jaime. Okay. I wanted to go a different route. I wanted to here, let's gear off skin shade. I wanted to go around right having a nice pattern going across the entire thing, right? So what I'm doing here, okay, is going, hmm, that I like a lot better. And right now I'm looking at the smooth version. I'm looking at a dynamic smooth, okay? So I'm now just using surface noise, but using the same idea. So I'm going to go to edit, and you can see here I have just this piece, right? And I've got an image that's controlling this. And I'm telling this image to be applied based upon UV layout. Okay? So I have this UV layout, and I've got the image going across, see the whole thing. And remember, see, this is so big because I don't care about the back. You're never going to see it. In fact, I might even just delete that back. And why waste the polygons, in essence? Okay? So... I have more UV space being used for this. I have an image, so I just click on here and see it turns off. I click on here again, and then I can turn it back on. So here's my flower pattern, and then boom, there it is. Okay? And then this is being repeated based upon this scale slider right here. So if I go, do I want it more repetitive, or do I want less repetitiveness happening? It's really up to me. Right? What do, what do I what am I really looking for in this? Right? So this is really giving me freedom. And again, I'm not I'm not married, as I like to say to this. I'm still trying to figure it out. Okay, Jimmy, we'll come back to the smoothing thing. So I'll explain it again for you. So now all I'm doing is is this what I like? And this is this is where I'm a fan of using surface noise and keeping dynamic. So right now I'm only 546 polygons, right? If I render, we're actually going to show you the result of what the surface noise would look like if it was applied. That's what we're going to do. So this is what it would look like. So I'm like, I like that. That looks good. I'm a fan of that. But we discussed, right? It's also on the back. I obviously don't want that. So we're just going to do a little handy dandy selection, right? And I can mask it out this way, right? Or again, guys, we can just switch to the gizmo, hold the control key and tap. And every other poly group gets masked, but the one that we're looking at, right? Again, so we can show a poly group, right? Mask that out and then flip it, okay, is one way. Or I can just switch to gizmo, hold control and hold country hold control and tap right and then now you can see the noise is only happening in that area okay so what i want to do again jimmy this goes back to you so there's a texture okay that's being applied to a 3d mesh but it's actually also being applied to a flat version of that right so think about like clothing 
So we're going the opposite. Uh, people that do clothing, they first have fabric they lay out, and then they make a pattern. They got to cut that pattern out, and then they got to sew it together. So in essence, they're going from flat to 3D. We're doing the opposite. We're going 3D to flat. So that's what UVs allows us to do. Okay. So I want to use this benefit and have this advantage. So because the image is actually being applied to the flat version, really, when I go to divide this up, okay, so if we turn on dynamic, turn off dynamic, and I start dividing it, right, I need to make sure that the correlation's happening here, right, that there's smoothening to both things. So if I divide up and I see the image changing like it did in the last one, that means that image right, needs to be applied with smoothing of the UVs, okay? So let's look at what we can do with this. So let's crease edge this, all right? Let's divide this up a little bit. Let's go divide, divide, divide. Let's go a little bit more. Uh, let's go to 2 million. So this is what I have, okay? What I'm going to do and what I'm a big fan of is this. Okay, again, I'm going to switch the gizmo. Yes, I'm a big fan of it. Hold control key and tap, right? Everything else gets masked out, like can't be any easier. So I've got a mask and I've got what I'm looking at. Again, everybody, we can render out and see that's what the result would look like if I hit this apply mesh. But before I do that, before I do that, I'm actually going to go to layers, and this is where I love using layers, and I'm going to show you why in a minute. I'm going to create a new layer first, then I'm going to hit apply to mesh. And that layer is in record mode, so what it's doing is it's applying it to the layer. And what's nice is the mask is also being applied to the layer. Okay, so if I come out of record mode, right, I have this result. Beautiful. But what if I've changed my, what does it look like maybe negative? Boom. I can just quickly, maybe my design's changed, and my boss comes to me and says, hey, uh, Paul, that's pretty nice, but in the, uh, in the original design, it's supposed to be pushed in, not a bust out, right? Uh, sweet, but because it's on a layer, I'm like, no problem. Easy peasy. And we don't even stop there. We can go to my boss. How deep do you want to put it down? You tell me where to step, and that's where I'll step, right? So I have an, a multiplier slider here, so I can even push it in more, or obviously go the opposite direction and push it out even more if I want to. So if I'm not liking that I don't have enough raised, okay, I can play with this. So I really like having it on a layer for this. Specifically, when I use surface noise with patterns, I always use a layer. That's probably the only time I use layers. Okay? So I really enjoy this process. And then if my boss comes to me, hey, guess what? We're changing the pattern. Guys, I'm doing this because I'm not telling you how many times I have a director or a director goes, hey, Paul, we're changing it. I'm like, oh, sweet. Thanks. All right. So who cares? Right? I have it on the layer. All right, whatever. Dude, turn it off. <laughs> Problem solved. Awesome. Thanks. And then delete it. It's gone. <laughs> right? So you guys could do this approach. Here's another approach that I want to show everybody that, it, that I like. Okay? So I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to mask out the portion. And guys, this becomes important. I'm going to show you something where it can be nice as well. And everything else is unmasked. And what I'm going to tell ZBrush to do is where there's a mask, apply the surface noise. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right? So you see this on mask by noise? So I'm going to click this. And then where there is the mask, that's actually where the pattern gets placed. It doesn't get placed anywhere else. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And then I can inverse this mask back and see now I got, in essence, the same thing. But this becomes kind of an important thing, okay? Let's grab another piece to show you something else. Man, I am Captain Tangent today, all right? So what I like to do is specifically also for clothing and cloth, excuse me, 
Watch this. Let's let's have a little fun here. Okay? Let's throw some let's throw some surface noise. Oh, I just lost I just lost my pen. I've lost my mouse. I've lost everything. Hold on. I got to I got to the, the driver from the tablet went kaput, I think. Hold on, let me see. Uh, guys, what do we say when something like this happens? Everybody say it with me. What do we say when something breaks on Paul or anybody in the streams? Go ahead. I'm going to go plug my mouth. Hold on. I've lost the driver. We, yeah, we say ABBK in these parts, right? You say blame Canada. I like it, Gary. I like it. Why not? I'm Canadian. All right, so I probably just have to restore the driver, which I can do. So, but forget it. <clears throat> I'm going to turn on the noise, okay? And we've got a little noise here. Boop, boop, boop. Beautiful. Wonderful. Just wonderful. I love that. Just wonderful. Okay, so let's make it a little bit bigger scaled. Okay, maybe play with the strength a little bit. Nah, I don't care. Let's also play with this curve because this is actually what's making the noise is this curve, right? Let's just put it in certain spots and let's add some clipping to this, right? And what's happening is the noise is pretty strong, right? So it's showing both sides, right? Because I have a pretty thin piece, so let's... Let's say, uh, let's add some clipping there. Let's clip that. Let's clip this down. Actually, let's just remove this point and move this point here down. So we can get something like this. Good enough. Let's say something like that. Let's go a little bit bigger scale. Say OK, right? And you can see it's showing it. It's like craziness. Right? Let's actually divide this up so we're getting real geometry here. Okay? And then now I'm going to tell it to mask by the noise. So you see that? There's only little parts being masked out. And what I really like to do with this is use this as a starting point for like ripped clothing, damage, armor. So, right, so now all I got to do is go to visibility and hide points, and then all those points get hidden. And now I've got a controlled way that's not me driving it, it's the program driving it. Okay? So it becomes a very nice, fun workflow. So with that said, you know, going back to this piece, right, we have a certain noise that I want to put on this. So we go back to our noise. Whoops. All right. Let's turn our noise back on. Let's go to edit. Okay. And let's even do a mix of noise. Right. So this is putting this now two noises in there. Right. So I can bump the strength up a little bit more. Right. And you can see it's being applied. So that gives it the extra push of being a little bit more metallic or metal. Right, but maybe I don't want it to go on the flowers. Okay, so I'm going to go into edit and I'm going to say how I want this to mix. See, there's only on the flowers, right? That's a difference of both. That's only on the flowers, and then the max going to be, right, giving you this. So it's not on the flowers as much. Okay, and then this mixture is controlling how do I want these to mix together. Right, so it's looking now at the image, right? So here we'll throw it just on the flowers. See, now you can have just the flowers have it. So I'm mixing up the textures. Well, I'm mixing the two noises together. So you can really have some craziness happen this way by just playing with these little options through here and it create a little bit of difference to your surface, right? And again, this is 
what do I want? Just maybe just a little bit of stippling to happen throughout there, right? And again, if I want to know what that looks like, just hit Shift R, and then that's what it's going to look like when it actually is applied to the surface. So it's a subtle, but it's enough to break up the specularity a little bit. That's really what I was looking for. Yes, the flowers are a, uh, a seamless no a texture. So it's it's tileable, vertical and horizontal. How many layers of noise you can have? And you're talking about in this layers? Infinity, man. We can go nuts with this. We can keep going down. Okay? So with this said, everybody, okay, going back, adding more to this element, okay, I want to do this. I want to actually control my masking this way, right? Because what I want to do is I actually like this logo in the middle, okay? So I'm going to tell ZBrush, watch this. I'm going to do it multiple things. And again, we can put this on a layer if we wanted to. I'm not going to bother with that. I'm going to say intensity, right? So now we got this mask. I'm going to inverse it, right? With symmetry on, I'm going to tell it to, I don't want any of this pattern. Actually, bad idea, Paul. Bad idea. I'm going to make sure everything else is masked off, right? That's what I want to make sure. Okay, and then I'm going to say I want a little impression of this logo now. So I'm just going to use inflate, right? So I'm combining, again, cake, layering a cake, right? And then so this is what I have. So now I got that logo. I kind of like that. Sir Jaime, right? And then now I've made another version of this which is going to help me to mask this out. Okay, so now I go to masking, right? And then I tell it again, mask by intensity, and now that logo is masked out for me. Beautiful. Now I can go to my surface noise, turn this back on, and now that pattern is only being placed, right, where the logo is. So for example, this is raised, so how about we do the opposite? Instead of this being raised, let's go negative with this. Let's push this in like that. And then now I have an offsetting happening. And if I hit Control H, I can hide the mask, right? And then again, Shift R, render it out, and see, is that what I want? And now I've got that raised logo off the chest, and I've got the pushing in of that flower pattern. Right, and that just helps the logo maybe pop a little bit more because we have opposites, opposites attracting here. Okay, so it comes in. A, this is just a way of me combining several noise options, several features to get to the point maybe that I want to get to. Okay, does that make sense, to everyone? Let me, I'm just catching up with questions. Sorry. Oh, I the flowers. It's just a pattern I found, and then I just I did some more flowering to it. It's just photo Photoshop. That's it. I'm, if you guys jumped on, uh, if you guys jumped on a uh, Google right now and did flower pattern, you would even find the one that I found, and then I cleaned it up because it wasn't a very good image. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm just going through the questions. Uh, Interesting issue. What happens if you quit? Uh, I don't, I'm falling behind on that question. Okay, so super great. So this is how I started doing Sir Jaime's patterns. Okay, let's move on here. Let's go on to the next thing that I want to talk about. All right. And I want to talk about how I created these disks here. Okay. It was pretty simple. So I'm going to load the tool that we have. Okay, here it is. Wee, it's beautiful. Okay, this is what I did. Right, so I'm like, I know I'm going to want to make a brush of these because I wasn't sure what flower pattern I really wanted to. So I just decided I'm going to make a brush. I have no idea what this is going to look like on the character. So I'm going to make multiple crazy different versions and then I'll be able to draw them out and decide then what I want to do with it. Okay. So right now I've got this disc. Again, this is all Z modeler, right? So very simple disc. This got started here. We'll show solo mode. All this is, okay. All it is is starting from a cylinder. 
Nothing fancy here. And I'm just adding edge loops and going about my business, right? It's just grabbing this thing, this cylinder thing that we were talking about, right? This is why I like to start with this stuff. Go to my initialize and say, I don't want an inner radius. I want to shrink it down and then say, make poly mesh, right? And then I switch to Z modeler. Okay, hover over an edge. Then I say, hey, let's bevel this. Bevel. Right? Let's add an edge loop through here now, like that. And then let's say I want to push this in. So I'm holding the Alt key to give a temporary poly group. And now I'll Q mesh this in, like that. And then go back. So you can, this is just all the process. It's nothing, nothing crazy. Okay. But what is something that is nice that some of you may not know is when I'm doing an insert edge loop, if you guys actually turn up your Z intensity, it actually is also going to inflate at the same time. So this was something I did do for this because I, I know I wanted to have a little roundness. And so I can move this and watch it, right? So with it smooth, right, dynamic, I can really see what is that going to look like rounded. Right? And then, of course, me, being me, I creased by Paul Gabriel, which is creased by polygroups, really. But darn it, I've got a button in there now. Okay? So I'm just creasing by polygroup. That's it. So it's looking at every single polygroup and applying a crease. So see, there's no polygroup down here. Right? So I could do almost the same thing, simply like this. See this crease tolerance? Let's change it to 45 and hit crease. This is the Joseph Dressed way. See, now that's creased, even though it doesn't have the same polygroup, right? So if I uncrease all and then did the same thing, say so they all get creased. See, but now that one didn't get creased because the, the change in angle is less than 45 degrees, right? So then I can, boom, there we go. And then me, I like to put my crease level at two, right? And then now when I up the smooth subdivisions of four, you get a nice softer look. It's not so harsh, right? So this is, that's all I did, okay? Pretty simple, right? Nothing crazy right now. And I'm keeping it very low polygon. That's a key thing to understand here as we start moving along here. Then there's another pattern. Here's the flowers, right? If you really look at it, they're very low. And then I also tried a sculptural one, and then I tried a different one with some noise, surface noise being applied. Right? So I'm trying various different versions. Okay? So let's look at this. Because I couldn't decide, right? Which was nice about this is watch this. That looks pretty cool. But all I'm doing is using a ray mesh. So I made, if I turn this off, I made one version of a petal. Right? It's very low polygons. Again, it started from a cube. All right? That's all I started from. So if we turn this off and we only look at solo mode, it's just a cube. That's all I did. It's nothing fancy here, okay? And then I'm telling ZBrush I want it to repeat around the center rotation part, right? So I turn on a ray mesh. I've got rotate. I say 360 degrees. Now the beauty is I wanted, do I want it to be maybe only six petals? petals? Kind of like that. I'm not sure if I like that one or not, right? So then I'm like, mm, do I like that? This is where it was me. I was like, oh, I don't know. Do I like the six? Do I like the eight pedestals? And then I started doing this. I'm like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Like the happy accidents happen. I'm like, oh, man, maybe that would look cool on him. I couldn't figure out which one I wanted, right? Because this is not actually on my character design-wise. So then I said, you know what? Why don't I just make a brush? that has the various versions of this, right? That's, that's it. So I can say, I kind of like this one, right? So I'm going to say, you know, give me that one. So I'm going to say merge visible. And again, key point here, low, low, low polygons. So everything is low polygons. And I'd like to point out again, nothing is being smoothed right now. That is very important. It's all low cage, okay? So even this little portion, right? I want that like this is what I really want, okay? And what I'm going to tell ZBrush to do is, you know what? Just merge visible. Boom, I've got a, you know what? I've got a new one. 
So you see what happens? I don't get the arrays. Okay, so I need to make sure for this workflow, I go to my array mesh, right? I tell it to make the mesh. It makes the mesh, right? And now I do a merge visible, which I could do this all in one click if I make a macro. Boom, there's one, right? So I'm going to go here, undo, and say, you know, what's it look like with eight? Kind of like that. I'm going to make sure it's like this. Let's apply it. Again, make a mesh, merge visible, right? So what I'm doing is just making various different ones right now, right? So let's do another one, undo, right? Let's let's bring it down to maybe, what does it look like with just four? That looks cool, right? And then guys, don't even, everyone don't forget, we can even adjust this. Let's see, maybe I want a wider one like that. And I'm seeing it all change because I'm using a ray mesh. And say that one's pretty cool. Let's make a mesh of that. And then let's just merge visible. So what I'm doing now is I've made various different ones. So I'm just now going to append the ones that I made, okay, to all the same subtool. So we'll call this, we'll rename this flower one. All right, we'll need rename this. Let's rename this flower two. Right, and then let's rename this flower, whoops, three. Okay, so I made in the original brush, I had like eight various different ones. Okay, and they're all sitting here, they're all ready to go. And now what I'm going to do is grab an insert mesh brush. It doesn't, it's irrelevant what really one I grab, okay, in all honesty, because I'm just going to create a new insert mesh brush, right? So I have these. Okay, but what I'm going to tell ZBrush to do now is look at these three subtools and let's make a brush based upon these three subtools. Okay, so how this sits in space is important. I'm going to make it look straight at me. Okay, and then I'm going to go brush. Okay, and create. I'm going to click the new button here, create multiple alpha brush. I'm going to click on that, right? And then it's going to create a brush now. It replaced those pieces. And then there I have it. So I've got my new brush now. right? And then, of course, I go to brush now and save this out and call it whatever I want to call it. Right? Simple. Okay, but now that I have the brush, okay, here's the workflow that I did. I wanted to know what is this going to look like right here, right? So all I did was I appended a shape. It, it doesn't matter what it is. It's, it's irrelevant what it is. It's just some kind of shape. I don't care what it is, right? So appending drops it all the way to the bottom of the subtool list, right? What I'd rather do is because I'm working on this, let's just insert this, okay? So I'm going to say, let's insert that shape. Good to go. There it is, all right? I'm gonna switch to the gizmo and I'm gonna size this down. I'm gonna size it down so small that you don't even really see it. It's, it's tiny. It's not relevant, really. The relevance of this is I'm using this to create a new subtool. And so now what happens is I'm actually drawing on this subtool, this little triangular cube thing that I'm making, but I'm using, right, the brush to draw it out. So now I go and say, let's draw this out and let's see what I get. And then there's that one, right? So do I like it like that? Is that the one I want? And then I can look at it smooth and decide, or maybe do I want to maybe shrink it a little bit? And you see how it's shrinking towards the center? That's because right now I have symmetry mount, right? So what's happening is both gizmos are moving the mesh. Okay, there's moving the mesh, right? I actually want to tell it to locally look at the mesh on an, both individual bases. Okay. Sorry, just taking a drink. All right, so the beauty of this is now I can go, well, 
maybe I wanted to go a little bit smaller. Is that the size I want? Is this the positioning do I want? Do I want to move it somewhere else? Put a little rotation on it maybe? It's really up to me, right? But what's beautiful is, again, I wasn't sure if I liked this one or not, right? And then I can look at it smooth. So now that the gizmo's on, all I have to do is come up here and tap on the other ones, right? And I'm going to start getting variations to those. So this one's flipped on me. So let me rotate it. There you go. And then now it's just swapping it out for me automatically, right? And then I can look at that one. I can look at that one. I can look at that one. And I can just cycle through, and then as a design, I'm like, see, for me, it looked that looked cool at first, but then when I put it on Sir Jaime and started pulling, like, eh, it doesn't really stand out anymore, right? And then that's why I wanted to start switching and seeing, well, this one, even this. So I ended up going with only the four clove leaves because it stood out so much more, specifically from a distance. I would have never have seen that until I actually put it on my character and at the size that I want and at the distance maybe that I'm going to show you this piece, right? I would have never saw that and seen, you know what, as cool as the other ones looked when I was just working on it, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't working for me. It wasn't doing what I wanted. So this really opened up my design and really f I honed in what I really wanted to happen off this. This is not instancing. No, this is, I've drawn out the mesh, and we have a feature that is allowing, when you're in gizmo, gizmo mode, anything up here can be swapped out. So even people, if, even if I switch to a completely different insert mesh brush, if I turn the gizmo on, I can swap out to anything. Maybe he's got bolts. Let's do sci-fi, Jaime. There you go. Those are laser beams. It's Halloween. We make our own night, right? So it doesn't matter. I can go back to the one that I made as well, right? Where, let's see, it is right here, right? And then now I can go back to Gizmo, click, and then see I'm back to these. So it's not an instanting. It's more of a replacement. Array mesh is an instanting. And what I'm about to show next, nano mesh is instancing. Okay? So this chain mail right? How I want to work on this chain mail was so easy. Excuse me. Believe it or not, all it is is a cylinder. So array mesh is on because I'm actually only got one arm and the other arm is being made by ZBrush. So this is an instinct. So if I turn this off, the other arm disappears, right? So this is going to allow me to do, like, I don't know why I would want to, but... I can repeat as many as I want, right? So this is an instance system. And what's great about this is if I switch to a brush and start pulling on the surface, see, it does it to all of them, right? So this is why I liked working with array mesh because again, guys, I'm everybody, I'm still trying to figure out the design as I'm working here. I'm still in the, I'm now starting to get into adding these details that I really want to have on this guy, Sir Jaime, right? So. I want to figure this out. So all I did was went to nano mesh, okay? And I have this mesh made and I'm telling it to go along all the surfaces. Okay? So, let's let's redo this from the get-go. So, let's delete. Let's go to inventory, okay? And let's just delete so all we are back to is having this. Okay, this is all we have. It's just it's just a cylinder. And I've it's been UV laid out. Okay? So it also even wraps. But it's that's not what's important for nano. It's just I'm looking at all the polygons is really what I'm looking at. Okay. So I'm gonna load, let's load that chain mail. Here it is. Here's the tool. Pretty simple, right? Polygrouping is important. It's going to allow me to select out portions. And because this is geometry, right, I'm going to want to start doing this, like making broken chain mail along the way. So having this phys be physical geometry instead of what we previously did where I actually was applying to the surface, I want this to actually be physical geometry. OK? 
okay? Because I want to start doing editing like this. I just picked up my mug. All right. So. Let's show all this, and I'm going to tell ZBrush, let's turn this into an insert mesh brush. Just like we turned these, right, into an insert mesh brush, I'm going to say, how about B and create insert mesh brush? Because I don't even have an insert mesh brush selected. And then I'm going to say, it's going to say, do you want a new one? I'm going to say new. And there you go. We've got chain mail. So as a user, I can do this all day long, right? Now, our problem is, we want this to be very specific, right? When we're drawing this out, okay, here, we're gonna turn solo mold off for now. I'm gonna do it this way. I need all this to be the same size, be rotated the same way, blah, blah, blah. That's a lot of work. So what I'm actually gonna tell ZBrush to do now is I'm gonna hit the B key, and instead of it being an insert mesh brush, I'm gonna turn it into a nano mesh brush. So I'm gonna click this. Okay, little button right here says create nano mesh brush, right? I'm going to click on that and it looks like nothing's changed, but what actually has changed, okay, is you can see now, this is now its own Z modeler brush. And this is a new Z modeler brush with the chain mail inside the insert nano mesh. So now I can draw out on the face, the chain mail, okay? And now what's very cool about this is I can keep drawing these out, but this is what I really love. Not in this case, but if you guys do this, right? Hold the Alt key, tap on the face. That's a temporary polygroup. I'm gonna switch, switch to Shift key. So again, I'm holding the Alt key, I'm tapping on the face, switching my finger to Shift. So I'm coming off the Alt key and switching to Shift. What I've just done is copy Okay, I've copied the polygon. Look up here, Steve Martin, three amigos. Look up here. All right, I've copied it, and now all I got to do. This is really cool. I love this. Okay, is I hold the Alt key and start painting. Now watch. If I let go of the Alt key, oh, I'm painting whatever's in there. That's what's being painted, and what that's doing is I'm adding to the already existing nano mesh. So the beauty of this is as I size this one up, it sizes them all up, right? And I can change the size. I have all these controls here, offsets. I have rotation capability here, right? And I can figure all this out, right? So it's a really cool way to take something and almost like paint mesh real fast. It's pretty awesome. I use it a lot. So think about if you're putting like flowers or think about trees or grass and things like that. You can, anything you can turn, right, into a mesh, you can turn into a nano mesh, and then we can do an instancing. So what I want to tell ZBrush is I want you to apply this to the entire surface. And mind you, I'm also a ray mesh. So what's happening on this side automatically happens to this side for me. Right? I don't have to worry about symmetry. I'm not even in symmetry and mode at all because I'm combining both instancing systems. I got an array mesh where I'm mirroring it, right? And then I've got nano mesh, which is also instancing the chain mail. So what I'm gonna tell ZBrush to do is I'm gonna hold the space bar and I'm gonna say all polygons. So instead of one polygon, I want it to go on all of them, right? And then now I can start doing stuff like this. Right, and now it's going everywhere. Okay, and every single polygon is getting this. So you see the show placement? I'm gonna turn this off, right? So that I can just look at what I wanna look at for as far as the chain mail. So you gotta make sure poly frames off. And what it does is the show placement hides the mesh. Okay, and when I'm done with this, I can still play with this. I can say, well, let's play with the rotation. Let's say zero, right? And start playing with this and going, hmm, let's start maybe trying alignment there along the normal. And then that way they're all facing 
the same. So you have alignments here, short edge, long edge, there's long edge, boom, done, chain mail. So I just had to find the right alignment. Now I've got chain mail, right? So these are saying how should they align because there's different normals happening, right? And different vertex rotation happening. So I'm just telling it, just find all the long edge and then just make them go all that way. And now I've got the chain mail and then the beauty part. I switch to the move brush, right? And I can start kind of playing with this mesh a little bit. Don't pull too much because you're obviously going to pull it apart because right, now the polygons are different size, right? And right now this is all trying to be consistent sizing. So it allows me to quickly do something like this. Right, figure out, yes. Just have a little bit of change happening in there to give it a little more realism so it's not so computer generated perfect. Right, I don't want that perfection. And when I'm happy with what I have, okay, I go down here and I just tell ZBrush to make it one to mesh. And then now it's a mesh. Right, so now I've got the inner portion, right, and I got the chain mail. Right, so I can start playing with all this. Right, so there's the polygrouping. So I need to get rid of the green, this internal green. So this is why also I would have polygrouping happening. Right, because I need to get rid of that piece. I don't need it anymore. Right, and then I still have, here we'll turn array off. Okay, so you can say I have all these polygroups and then I can say modify topology delete the hidden, that's gone. And now you as a user can decide little individual pieces. You can make it do whatever you want, right? Pick and choose what chain mail you wanna show, not show, right? Maybe switch to the lasso and start just, just being very random here with what you want to show and not show, right? Do -do -do. Right, Do -do -do. okay. Just breaking it up. Break it up so I'm just doing random selection right now okay I'm gonna inverse it and you see there's the portion so I'm grabbing little bits watch this boom I've got the whole bits now so now this is keeping it whole let me redo that everybody let me redo that so again I'm just using let's go through the whole thing I've got now real geometry and I'm just using Lasso to just get, do some random, just break it up, right? I don't want it all to be the same, same thing. You know, I want him to have a variation because, you know, he's in a battle. He's Sir Jaime. He's battling us in the office. Sir Jaime. He's been knighted, right? So you can see all that variation that's happening now. Very nice. But I'm getting little bits of the rings, right? I'm not getting all that chain mail. Okay, so I'm going to inverse the selection and I'm going to tell ZBrush to grow all now. So what it's doing is every little bit that I have there, give me the whole actual ring. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a shortcut that's in the visibility. So right here, there's a grow all button. I'm just doing control shift A. Okay, that's all I'm doing is control shift A. Jimmy, there's no need to Z-remesh it. It's already really low polygons, right? That's the key here is that chain mail is hardly any, like how many polygons is it? See, it's only a thousand polygons. There's nothing to remesh, right? It's perfect. There's no need to Z-remesh this. If you had a mesh that you want to remesh, absolutely, you can do that. That's the point of edit, right? So what I'm doing here again is I'm growing all and then inversing it and going, boom, there we go. Now I have variation chain mail happening, right? Okay, and then I'm telling ZBrush, all right, let's go to modify topology and delete hidden. And then there you go. And now that one's got that. And then now I start the same process over here and make it be different. So we have asymmetry happening, maybe something like that. Flip it, grow all, flip it, right? Mm. It's not changing enough. Let's flip it, grow all, flip it again. There we go, that's better. And then delete hidden, and then boom. Now I've got this 
model, right, we start turning everything on with some nice variation. But again, we started with a pattern that was very computer generated. Right, so let's uh, let's bring our chest back on. Let's bring all this back together. It's all coming together, right? There, that's starting to look a little more realistic because the chainmail is not perfect anymore, right? There's some, and then I can throw surface noise on that chainmail, okay? And go about this. So the thing to understand again about nano, so here, let's grab, no, let's not grab a cube. Let's grab a plane. Okay, so this is great questions that are coming through. So let me answer some of these questions. Let's not make this so much. So let's go by five by five. Okay, and we'll make that a poly mesh. All right, if I just grab here, let's reset all brushes. Okay, and now let's grab this primitive one again. And I'm gonna say brush, create nano. And now it's a nano, right? So I can draw this out and I can grab any piece that I want, right? Okay. So do I want this or do I want that, right? Draw this out. And now I have something like this, right? It's just a cube, right? So let's copy it and then let's put it in a couple other places. Boom, boom, boom. Simple, easy, right? So here's the beauty of nano. So like you asked, Jimmy, okay? I can edit the mesh, and now I'm looking at this cube, right? So I can even say, let's cue mesh this out and just make some variation to the cube now. I don't know. Do whatever we want. It's our world, man. We're just, we're just making art. There. Bob Ross, happy little trees, right? So no matter what I do, boom, they all update. This is the beauty of Nano. No matter what I do to this, it's going to update. And when you're doing nano, the goal, Jimmy here, is to keep the polygon count as low as possible because even though it's an instancing system, so it's only it's not affecting really the geometry. So even if I keep adding pieces here, right? You're not really affecting it too much. So let me switch back to nano mesh. Right? I draw this out. See the polygon counts not changing. Right, even if I even put this little pill, because these are instances. But at some point, you guys will want to convert these instances into real geometry. So the goal here is when you are doing this, stay as low as you can in the geometry, right? That opens you up and it's also easier to edit. Okay, that's, that's an important thing to realize too about nano mesh. Okay, and if I was creating um, chain mail, I don't think I have installed it here. I would use the plugin uh, Nano Nano Tile because it's using what I'm doing right now. It's using array mesh with Nano Mesh, and that's how easy it would be to make a tileable chain mail. When you export the instance geometry, well, because this is an instance for ZBrush. So if you export this, you're not going to get, right now, if I exported this, you're not going to get everything. You're just going to get the plane. you got to actually convert it to geometry, right? Because this is something that's only inside of ZBrush, this nano mesh, right? It's something we made, so it's not in all other programs. So the other programs aren't going to see this. You have to turn it into mesh. The only other program that will work with this is if you have Keyshot and the bridge, so if you have the bridge capability, this actually will send over and give you the result. We'll convert it for you. Okay, but if I'm going to go to any other program, okay, I need to convert it in geometry. You can say one to mesh, that converts it to geometry. Or if you guys want to convert all the nanos in one click, you hit this convert BPR to geo. And then boom, see, it's all geometry. Now this will export as you see. It doesn't matter what the polygon is, everybody. That's, that's not, it's just, the only relevance is a polygon, right? So even if I grab this with poles here, let's, let's drop this way down. Maybe not that much. Let's go, let's say 10. Okay. Something like this, make poly mesh, right? And then nano, see, it doesn't matter. Even if I go to this triangle, it's the same thing. 
it just needs the polygon face for alignment. It needs the polygon face for something to draw on. So that's where the polygon face becomes important. Okay, because now if I'm going to this, right, these alignments based upon, see, what we're doing, this is just only flipping the one. It's not touching the other one. So see, there's this version and then there's this version because I'm drawing on. So then this alignment can be completely different if I wanted to. Right? So that's the only thing the polygon face is for. So right, see, I can size this one up, size this one down. It doesn't matter if it's a triangle or a quad. And ZBrush only accepts quads and triangles because that's the only thing you can sculpt on. You can't sculpt on an N-GON. That's why ZBrush doesn't allow N-GONs because you can't sculpt on it. Does that answer the questions, Josh and Jimmy? I don't bake the details, Josh, at all. Specifically, if I'm just going to stay inside a ZBrush or go to Keyshot, there's no point in baking the nanos or array mesh. If I'm in a production atmosphere or something like that, and I need to get out of ZBrush into another program, whether it be Maya, Max, Moto, Blender, whatever you want to use, then yes, I want to bake those and turn it into real geometry. When you say, Jimmy, would Chainmail wouldn't hold the scale? What do you mean by that? It will hold the scale. So is this size slider is an X and is a ratio thing. So if I hit it to one, that's actually physically the size of one of what the original pill capsule was, right? So I can go twice as big of the original scale size and then see it's twice as big, or I can go half the size, go 0.5, and it's now half the size. I can even tell it to just fit right within the face, right? So if I put this back to one, it's now fitting right within the face. You can even do a fill and it'll stretch it. See, that's where the change is. So if we go to the one with the triangle and we put this at one, right? And then I tell it the fill, see, it tries to take on the triangle. And then see, I can rotate this and have some crazy fun with this if I wanted to. Right, and then I can offset along the Z, right? This is where the polygon face now comes into play. If I want it to fit within the polygon, or fill within the polygon, right? Which can become very important, right? And I'm just switching these and see this one's on fill, so it's taking the face. So if I go to the third one, which is this one, and I tell it to fit or fill, and as long as scale's at one, it's gonna try and fill the whole space, right? So it's trying to match and fill this mesh. What's up, Rabbit? So does that answer your question? Yes, it'll hold its size no matter what, the polygon, because you can use this size slider to make it any size you want. So you can go up to a 10 times larger than the original size. Okay, so going to one means just put it, it's a one-to-one -one ratio of what the original pill size was. It's not actually using the polygon size face. What's the difference between micro mesh and nano mesh? This is it. I can do all this editing, right? We can even do something like this, right? If I do all polygons, we right? And do, whoa, that looks cool. Hide the placement. And then let's do some randomness to it. You can randomly have these go everywhere, right? And again, it's not reliant on the polygon size, the polygon face at this point in time. I can change the random seed. People, we can even do something like this. We can tile them. So I can say a tile of four, a tile of four, right? And now they're tiling on every single face, but then I can say, how do I want those to tile? So there's different patterns, a plus sign. So here, you can see this better on a cube. Here, let me, let's make this a cube. Uh, yeah, let's make that a Q mesh, okay? Let's grab an insert mesh here. Let's grab one of these so we can use a screw head. Let's hit B, create nano mesh. Now it's a nano. And I'm just going to say again, all polygons, right? And I'm going to say, I want this one instead. There, right? And it's going on all polygons. And right now, I'm hiding the placement. Right? So if I show placement, you'll see the polygons. 
So I can say, how big do I want them? Let's just say a one-to-one -one ratio, so it's massive, right? But what I'm going to say is, let's tile these up. So let's go tile of four by a tile of four, right? And then now let's play with the size and say, let's go 20% size. That looks pretty good. Let's go 10%, so 0.2. Uh, I like 20%, so 0.2. Now that these are tiling, I can say, all right, let's put a plus sign. Boom, plus sign. Let's put, I don't know, let's put it corners, right? Inset. Let's put grid inset. Let's see what that does. Let's do a grid, right? Let's do only along the border, right? And if I drop down this tiling, right, or up the tiling, I can change it on the fly. So see all this? You can't do this with MicroMesh. You cannot do all this editing and changing with MicroMesh. And MicroMesh is dependent upon the actual polygon shape and size. Okay, it's going to take on that look. Right, so that's the difference. So MicroMesh, for those that know, is right here. So you uh, switch a plane, let's say switch to a plane again, right? And you do this, and then MicroMesh is saying, well, what mesh do you want to put on it, right? So I can say this, and then this is telling me in the render palette, okay, in render properties, I need to draw a MicroMesh, right? And then I hit Shift-R, and then that's what I'm getting. And see the order now is wrong, so I got to take the time to go and flip that mesh so it's facing the right way. I don't have to do any of that, right? And then if you guys start pulling on the mesh a lot, like say doing something like this, doing really craziness, right? When you render, you see it's actually stretching that flower out, right? It's that's what nano mesh doesn't do, and then it's in it's a better instancing system. So in essence, nano mesh, think about the nano mesh is a combination of insert mesh brushing and micro mesh, right? Think about it in that sense. Got it? Um, I'm just reading a question. Uh, I'm reading around. Can you increase the micro mesh multiplier value on your Red Wings goalie five hole, please? No. Not at all, Doug. Go, Rick, go Wings. I like it. Good joke. Um, Robin, when you're going back and forth between Maya, you got to make sure what world are you in Maya, number one. Okay? So if you're in centimeter world, by default, ZBrush is going to be a millimeter world. So if those don't match up right, you're going to run into scaling problems, obviously. But we're storing all values in the import-export, so no scale should change unless you as a user has done something to physically change the scale or you're not setting both programs in the same world. But that would cause a problem. But you guys could also use GoZ Maya, right? If you use GoZ Maya, which we updated for 4R8, it's faster, it has more features, it'll send creasing, it'll send polygroups, it'll send textures back and forth, and all you gotta do is click one button, GoZ, right? Or all subtools, and it goes back and forth between Maya and ZBrush. It's really simple. Yes, GoZ is free. It comes shipped with ZBrush. So all you do is go right here, see where it says GoZ all invisible? You hit this little R, and you see, I don't have Maya installed on this computer, so it, I can't show you, right? Right here, we use Cinema 4D, 3D Max, Maya, Photoshop, Sculptress, also Modo as well. I just don't have the plugin installed because Modo now, um, the Foundry handles GoZ, okay? And all you do is hit, I want to go to Maya, and then GoZ sends a selected subtool, all sends all subtools, Visible sends only the visible ones. It'll work with Maya 2015 and up only. So 15 through 2018. We didn't do anything with Blender GoZ, so that's not us, Indy. You got to go to Blender and ask them. Because GoZ is also like a scripting that people can do. Okay, so again, Maya 2015, 16, 17, and 18. The new GoZ will work. 
And again, we improved it big time, like for this 4R8 release, right? So that should answer your question, yeah? Does that answer your question? Um, I forgot who was asking me that question. So Halloween, Sir Jaime. Oh, I got a question here. And I'm stitching, is there a way to shorten a curve brush you've already drawn? Sure, sure, sure. So you wanna draw out a curve and then get rid of it. You can only edit it. So you can't just chop off portions of the curve. You can change the curve, right? So if I'm drawing anything, let's see, let's select Let's select those, okay. Let's go in the light box, right, and project, and let's go into the brushes. There, beta testing, here's some stitching. There, there's a good stitch, right? So when you guys are drawing out this stitch, right, you can get this, but all you can do is edit it, right? So I can draw out like this, and when I cross back over, it's going to edit. That's it. You can't, you can't delete this portion if you wanted to. That's what you're asking. You cannot do that. But because we're in this world right now, okay? Do you see this? This is all off on a great feature that I use all the time. I frame the mesh based upon the polygrouping. Right now, this is really low, right? And then now, if I just tap, right, I'm going to get the stitching everywhere that I want. Right, so it'd be better for me to do this. So let's get rid of this. Let's delete this stitching. Let's undo. There we go. Let's go to dynamic and let's apply it and delete lower so I have more density. Go to stroke, frame the mesh. And now it's framing wherever there's a polygroup change. How big do I want the stitch to be? And then I just tap and then there you go. I get stitching everywhere perfectly around. So if I wanted this to be more of like a leather instead of a metal, there's a quick way to do it. But unfortunately right now, no, there's no way to edit, shorten the curve. You can only edit the curve. And then now I have something like that. Uh, how to import multiple subtools? Uh, you would have to do the plugins. So in Subtool Master, that's Scale Master. Subtool Master, there's a multi append right here and a multi insert. So when you click this button, it's looking for any OBJs and CTLs, and you can import all the OBJs on all of them. Right. So if I want the Chainmail and Flower Disk. I can say open those both and see it's appended both of them. There, they're both in the scene now. They're both on this same tool. So that's what it's doing. It's going through the whole process and making sure I append what I need to append. There, it's done. And then now I've appended two tools. Now he's like, I'm floating, right? And then because I hit multi append, they go to the bottom. Multi-insert, will put them right below. That's important for things like when you guys are using live Boolean. That's where it'll become very important, how you want that to append. And see, it does the whole tool. See, it's even bringing over the whole, all sub-tools because they did a tool, right? It's bringing over all of it. Okay, so that's how you do that. Or you guys could also use if you want to, use FBX, depending on the year. Okay, you could do that. All right, hopefully that answers that question. A quick way to get perfect polygrouping around something like the shoulder pad? Yeah, well, that's where it comes down to, again, what you're working with, right? This is already low low cage, right? So I can start using, I already had it polygrouped off, right? So by me staying, again, low polygon, it's gonna be easy 
for me to select out what pieces I want. Right, but this also leads to, guys, you could do stuff like, right, this is where I have to say this piece. Okay, let's actually apply this. So let's say we have something more like this, and let's make it have no polygroup. So it's just one polygroup. Right? What I can do is, is switch to this smart transpose, right? And then hold control key and just grow it. Right? And if I don't grow enough, I can hold the control key, click and hold the shift key and it adds to the actual masking. Right? So you see there's a little part right there I didn't quite get. Hold control key and then shift key. And then there you go. Right? And what this is doing is masking, right? So all I have to do is now is control W and then there's a new polygroup. However, the thing you guys got to understand about this, this has got subdivision levels. So there are vertex points that are existing at level five but that don't exist at level one. So you can see it's going to change the polygroup. And then now that is the polygroup. So you always want to make polygroups at the lowest subdivision level, right? So, cause this is so low, this is super easy to do. Like this, I would just use, and honestly for this, I would just use the um, Z modeler. I would go to Z modeler over the space, go polygrouping. Then I'd say even six sides and tap. Right? So I wouldn't have the subdivision levels. And I'd say, how about do it to all polygons? Right? And it's trying to find different poly polygrouping for me. Right? So I can say, no, it's only three sides. Right? So it's only giving me a certain number of polygroups. But I can just do this temporary. Right? And then now I'm just painting the polygroups. So something like this, that's how, what I would do. Does that make sense? I forgot who asked that question. Uh, where'd it go? Yeah, there's a great trick here that someone's brought up. So if you guys want to shorten a curve, switching to another curve brush that allows you delete, right? And then I can delete, delete, and delete, delete, and delete. And now I've shortened that curve, right? So if I do this, Right, and I want to shorten it. All I got to do is draw this, and then now I just delete it. There you go. I just shorten the curve, and now I switch back to this, and then ZBrush takes on the curve. So that is that is a great trick. So you can use the zero mesher guides, or you can use the topology brush that we were using when we were doing Sir Jaime. Okay, let me see. Could you make a how to uh, I don't know 3D Studio Max, Jock. That's something I don't use. I'm a Maya guy. That would be a question for Drust. That's really boring too. I'm not gonna lie. That's boring stuff. But I don't, unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know 3D Studio Max. I've been using Maya since like version two, since 1997. Wait. So let's see. When you crease by PG on a low Geometry mesh, sometimes it doesn't retain shape when you divide mesh. No, there should be no reason for that at all. I would I would need to see it. So if you have a particular model that you can share with me that you're having that problem with, I would want to see that. So you can send it to streaming at pixelogic.com. Right? So if we just look at this, right, and I say control W, or new polygram, and I say, right. I don't actually don't want that. I want to crease by polygroup. Every polygroup now the change is going to get a crease. So when I divide up, that creasing is being maintained. So you're saying that's not working for you. If somebody asked that. I forgot who it was. Uh, somewhere around there. So there should be no change. Oh, Josh, you were asking, when you create a polygroup around the low polygon mesh, it should retain the shape. The only reason why it doesn't retain the shape is if you've dropped this lower crease level, then that would change the shape, right? But if I'm just even grabbing something as simple as a cube, right? Let's grab a cube and let's actually make it a cube again. <laughs> uh, so instead of three sides, let's make it four. 
right? And I make poly mesh, right? Even if I don't even have crease by poly groups, but if we want to, let's go to poly grouping. Let's do a crease by normals and then do a crease by PG. So every poly group has the crease, right? If I'm dividing, it's never going to not be a cube. It's always going to be a cube. So the only reason why this wouldn't happen is if you've turned this slider down and then you start dividing. So division one, it's a cube. Division two, it's a cube. Division three, now it's not a cube anymore. Now it's the Apple TV. <laughs> Just a tall version of it. Okay, does that answer that question, Josh? Okay, I'm going to be heading out to lunch here. So is there any last minute questions that we have? So again, we covered a lot today. It was a lot of fun. We were Halloween funning it. We we're putting my, uh, my boss, Sir Jaime. We're making Sir Jaime look like a knight. Why not? Right? So it was a lot of fun. I would like, to, um, my goal here is to hopefully finish this piece. I'm going to try and finish it this month, um, this November. And maybe I can show you guys what the final piece would look like. Because I might replace and not have it be Sir Jaime, make a different guy completely. I haven't decided yet. Okay, any last minute questions? If you guys have, sorry I've been gone for the last couple months, but uh, it's been busy with the uh, Zebra Summit and a bunch of other things been going on. I've been traveling, doing some trainings. How is my age? Are you mean you're asking how old I am? Is that what you're asking? 3PNS dot D-O-T-O-T? -O -O -O? Uh, if that's what you're asking, I'm old. <laughs> Not that old, but I'm I'm getting up there. Okay, uh! so that's it for the questions. It looks like that's it for the stream. Again, thank you for tuning in. Hopefully you had as much fun as I did and you guys got a bunch of different ideas and thoughts. Again, I want to leave you with thinking about ZBrushes like that cake. Right? <laughs> Paul, lunch is canceled. We order pizza. I like that, Chuck. <laughs> That's funny. I like it. All right. So let's, uh, we're again, next week's going to be dress. Okay. They are all recorded. All these are recorded. You have all the videos. So there is over 463 videos already on this channel. Anybody that's on our streaming line here on ZBrush Live, it's all recorded. We put it here on our Twitch channel and on our, our YouTube. Okay? So the next one is going to be Joseph next Tuesday, and then I'm the following Tuesday. So normally we do a voting. So I don't know where the votes are at because mine's not updating live. So whatever you guys, the topic you guys pick, that's what we'll focus on in two weeks and take a look at that. All right? So thanks again for tuning in. All right, let me get one last more swig here. <laughs> Shameful. So, and as always, let us know if you have any questions. Again, streaming at pixelogic.com, especially that person said that they had the mesh that wasn't working for them. Send it to us. Let me take a look at it, right? And that way I can communicate with you and see what the problem might be. Okay, we're happy to help in any way we can. That's why we're doing these ZBrush Lives as well. We want to make sure you guys are all walking away inspired and wanting to ZBrush. So now everyone go make their own night. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm sorry. All right, so bye. Have a wonderful Halloween. Be safe if you're going out there with your kids trick-or-treating, okay? And go by uh, it. So if you want to know, I'm assuming you want to know how much the bottle is that I'm using. I'm being shameful. Um, on our store, you can go there. I I think it's, hold on, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me take a real quick look, real sorry, since you're asking, I'm ass is that what you're asking? Is how much is the bottle? <laughs> uh, let's see, let me go to the store. Then I'll show you the link, I'll get you the link. It is $34.95 plus shipping. So here you go. Here is the link. If you did want one, if, if that's what you're asking, I have no idea what you're asking. Do I shop at Ross? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> have a great 
great Halloween and a fantastic holiday season. We're getting into it. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Okay. There's no link to GoZ 2018. It's built with inside of ZBrush. There is no link. All you do is hit this little R and then ZBrush is going to look for the programs. Okay. If you don't, you can go here to preferences and here there's a GoZ menu. You can click right here, path to Maya. Just click this and then it's trying to find Maya. Oh, see, so I do have Maya. So I can hit Maya install and then it's going to install the plugin and then boom, now it's installed. It's that simple. There's no link. Yeah, it is a swell. It's, it's a, you know what? The reason why I'm being silly about the bottle, it's important. The swell bottle, what's really nice about that company is for every swell bottle that is purchased, they plant a tree. And I'm all about the environment. So I love that part. And not using plastic bottles really is a way to go for me personally. So, um, But that's it for GoZ. Again, you can go into your preferences. You just say Path to Maya. Right? And then that'll install the plugin for you. It's right there, baby. Okay, and there's even installer in the program files. In the troubleshoot and help, there's an install for just GoZ. Okay, again, one more time. <laughs> Bye! Ready? Paul is out. Thank you again for tuning in. Peace!